Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Uh, be sure to follow us, by the way, on Twitter at twitter.com slash UNC knowledge. Twitter.com slash UNC knowledge. Send comments, suggestions, uh, let us know the guests you'd like to see. A classicist and military historian, Victor Davis Hansen is a fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. He's the author of countless, and they are countless, I tried to do a count, Victor, countless essays and columns, and of books that include Warfare and Agriculture in Classical Greek, Greece, The Western Way of War, Infantry Battle in Classical Greece, A War Like No Other, How the Athenians and Spartans Fought the Peloponnesian War, Carnage and Culture, Landmark Battles in the Rise to Western Power. And that name's about a third of your opus, I think. Our topic today, an essay that Dr. Hansen published on National Review Online this autumn, entitled, The New Old World Order. Quote, I'm quoting you, Victor. The post-Cold War New World Order is rapidly breaking apart. Nations are returning to the ancient passions, rivalries, and differences of past centuries. Close quote. Very briefly, why is this happening? Well, it's happening because all of these artificial constructs like the European Union or the United Nations or even things like NATO, uh, they have a small shelf life and they're not as strong emotions as tribal affinities, ethnic affinities, religious affinities. And uh, so the world is returning to the way it's always been. All right. Segment one, take Europe. Victor Davis Hanson, quote, take Europe. The decades old vision of a united Europe is dissolving. Divides between Germany and Greece, for example, remain too wide to be bridged by fumbling bureaucrats in Brussels. Close quote. The European Union, they just celebrated their 50th anniversary a couple of years ago to enormous um, self-acclaim, at least. So what's going on? Well, there will always be a European Union. It just won't do anything. It will be sort of like the Masonic Lodge today in small town America. <laughs> it's going to be there, but nobody's going to really belong or do much to it. So when I read the Greek newspapers today, or I read the German newspapers, it reminds me of 1939. you got all the stereotypes that you've always had. There's sunny people down south in places like Italy and Spain and Greece, and they're sunny lazy. Sunny serious. Yes, and they're yelling, they wave their hands, they, they don't know how to do accounting. They take siestas, and then there's all these rigid Nordic and Germanic peoples that are working from six to six to pay for them. That hasn't changed. It goes back to antiquity. So uh, the European Union tried to, by fiat or convention, say that uh, they wouldn't exist anymore, those differences. But the difference between Greece and Germany is much more than Mississippi and Minnesota. Well, so you just said that the European Union will just sort of continue to exist, all those bureaucrats in Strasbourg and Brussels will remain in place but become irrelevant. Yes, I think so. It'll be so. just kind of a dead weight on European society. Will the euro, the currency endure? I think there'll be, at some point, the Germans will not want to subsidize everybody and they'll go back, they'll, they'll go back to their mark and they'll go back to the drachma and devalue it. When I lived in Greece, what Greece is doing now happened all the time and all they would do is devalue the currency, inflate the economy and then sort of laugh and sleep their way back to prosperity. And they can't do that now with the euro, but they will be able to when it breaks apart. I think it will gradually. It'll be an insidious process. It won't be a, it'll be with a whimper rather than a bang. Um, you're familiar with Mark Stein's argument in America alone that Muslim immigration and high Muslim birth rates are transforming Europe into Eurabia. Uh, recent events in Europe, June 9th, Dutch elections, Gert Wilder's Party for Freedom wins 24 seats, becoming the third biggest party in Parliament. September 14th, the French Senate approves a ban on wearing the burqa, a ban that had already passed the French Assembly by 335 to 1. September 19th, the Swedes hold elections, and a party called Sweden Democrats wins 20 seats in the 349-member Parliament. I'll quote the AP. Quote, the far-right party, we're talking about Sweden Democrats, demands sharp cuts in immigration and has called Islam the greatest foreign threat since World War II, close quote. So, the drift to Eurabia is being arrested? 
Uh, Europe, there's a European, that there's a reassertion of Europe proper? They have two problems, and it's, it, it transcends demography, because in theory, if, it wouldn't matter how many Muslims came if they became good Europeans. That's not happening for two reasons. The European left is multicultural, and that is they don't believe in themselves. They can't argue that Europe is better than the alternative. They have no concept of the history or appreciation of the Renaissance, Enlightenment. They don't see themselves as exceptional. So then why should people who come uh, see them as exceptional? So they're not integrating people in the way the United States is doing a much better job, at least until recently. And then the other problem is Europe's always been, for all of its socialism, a class-bound society. It doesn't intermarry. It doesn't integrate. Uh, as well as the United States. We're a plutocratic society. You can get status by making money, no matter what you look like, where your parents were born, or where you go to school. In Europe, you're always located in time and space by where you were born, the sound of your voice, who your parents were. And that makes it very hard for immigrants to get social, economic, cultural acceptance. And you put that left and right-wing impediment, and then you end up with something like uh, Rotterdam or the... Um, suburbs around Paris. So I'm very pessimistic about that. In Rotterdam or sub suburbs around Paris, you have an extremely dense Muslim-only population where there's a, at least a tendency towards Sharia. They're, they're, they're simply, it's simply a kind of um, Muslim world implanted yes, it, in Europe. And it's full of self-contradictions where they want to escape the autocracy of the Middle East and the poverty. They come to the West and they are given freedom, but then they resent the fact that they're unequal. They want instant parity because that's what they've told the EU does. And then the EU says, well, we give them all this money, we give them all these entitlements as long as they don't come into our neighborhoods. Why are they angry? And that's so the problem is insoluble. It's insoluble. All right. Um, Europe and the United States. CNN Online on September 28th, quote, a potential plot against Europe was one factor contributing to the uptick this month in missile strikes by unmanned drones against terrorist targets in Pakistan, according to a U.S. official. The U.S. official is quoted as saying, we would be remiss not to try to take action to thwart what might be underway in Europe, close quote. It's a long way, long time, since Europe lay prostrate in the ruins of the prostate, prostrate, <laughs> I've reached the age at which that difference matters, uh, in, after the Second World War. This is now a rich society. Why isn't the defense of Europe the business of Europe? Two reasons. One is that it's, tr it's a generic generic truth for any society that the more affluent and leisured they become, the less they're willing to make sacrifices. And you add that to the demographic paradox, paradox where you only have one child who's a precious child. So that European parents are saying, we need more money for, for all these social entitlements, especially as we age. We only have one child. We don't want to lose them in some god-awful place like Afghanistan. And that creates a utopian pacifism. Well, if you but will. why should we Americans continue to insulate them from reality? Well, We've been taking nothing but the back of their hand since the, the war on radical Islam began. We do because 1917 and 1918 and the failure of the Versailles Accords and then the disasters from when we got in in 41 to 45, and we said we decided somewhere around 1946 that these people will kill each other and they will draw, draw us in unless we create uh, the United Nations or NATO or they create the EU, and that was the premise. But the, what we never in our wireless imaginations thought is that the more that we would subsidize their defense, the more like angry, petulant teenagers they would resent their parents for that subsidy, and that's what's happened.